Avatar The Last Airbender is one of those series that is really all over the emotional spectrum. It will make you laugh with the likes of The, the Boulder. Boulder, it will make you angry with the Sandbenders, and it will rip your heart out with Iroh and Zuko. But amongst the many, many themes it explores, one that has always fascinated me the most is the darker side of Avatar and the ways it explores horror. Horror as a genre has always been something that I am deeply interested in, in large part due to just how diverse our perceptions of what truly scary can be. There are very primal fears such as darkness and heights. But then there are weirdos like me who absolutely love heights and dream of just being able to dangle my legs off of the highest places in the world. Though we also have these extremely niche fears such as trypophobia, the fear of holes. Whatever you do, do not look it up, you do not want to discover that you have it, just move on and forget about it. I am being serious, this isn't a haha -ha YouTube don't look it up, seriously don't look it up. But the point I'm getting across is that in something like Avatar, a series that was obviously aimed at relatively younger audiences, you would expect something more surface level, right? Scary big man in the night that our gang has to fight, or something like that. And while it also has plenty of that, there's a smaller arc in the series that I think exemplifies some of those more insidious fears that lurk within all of us. Ones that do not leverage some spooky figure in the night, but rather this almost primal existential uneasiness that stems from the loss of control. What I'm describing here is of course the Lake Laogai arc in Book 2 of Avatar. At the heart of this arc, we primarily deal with three major themes. Identity, isolation, and truth. Themes that are of course present throughout most of the series, but are twisted into something much, much more unsettling here. And all of that begins with the gang entering Ba Sing Se for the very first time. At this point in the story, Appa has of course been kidnapped. So alongside delivering the invasion mission plans, the gang hopes to find some leads to everyone's favorite flying bison good boy. And right from the get-go, we hear the gang say that finding a huge flying bison should be relatively easy. Though that is then swiftly subverted as we see the sheer size of Ba Sing Se, immediately establishing the theme of isolation in this arc. We are in what is by far the largest city in the world of Avatar, the absolute heart of the Earth Kingdom. Yet despite the bustling population, Team Avatar is incomplete. It's the age-old paradox of loneliness not being the same as being alone. Aang has rest of the gang right by his side, though we still see him lash out multiple times with him clearly missing his most loyal companion. And as is often the case with Avatar, the same theme extends to our other major players. Those being Zuko and Jet. Zuko and Iroh have quite comfortably found themselves working in a tea shop. Though despite his uncle's joys about a now much more peaceful life, Zuko finds himself disillusioned by this way of life, something that is only further complicated after he learns that both Appa and Team Avatar are somewhere within Ba Sing Se. So yet again, he might be surrounded by people who really enjoy his work. He and his uncle, who clearly loves him very much, are offered a life-changing opportunity to open their own shop in the very heart of the city. He even finds himself a date, which we won't cover because that is a Tales of Ba Sing Se thing. But point is, even in spite of all of that, he feels alone and lost. And the same can be said for Jet. Even before entering Ba Sing Se, he noticed Iroh warming his tea with firebending, which then starts his whole mission of trying to expose them as firebenders. Though unlike the gang in Zuko, with Jet, that sense of isolation is immediately interwoven with the identity angle, as he quickly finds himself asking whether he is the crazy one here. He clearly saw Iroh bend, irrespective of his personal feelings about him, that is a fact. But to others, they worked alongside Zuko to get food. They spent quite a bit of time with them and bonded as refugees of the war. So to them, Jet's accusations seem almost nonsensical. And so because he believes that no one is taking him seriously, Jet desperately seeks to confirm his own beliefs which naturally sends him down the spiral of increasingly out there attempts, culminating in him just deliberately attacking them. If you've been around the interwebs for a while, this personal echo chamber that eventually spirals into something very, very bad should probably ring some frighteningly real examples as well. Though again, that is only one aspect and the surface level of this very unsettling arc. Because as the gang makes it into Ba Sing Se, they are immediately met by Ju Di, who is literally a walking red flag. Many of you will have likely heard of the Uncanny Valley or the theory of perceptual mismatch. In essence, it is the relation between the human likeness of a particular object, in most cases these were robots, and the human affinity for said object. In layman's terms, robots with a human-like appearance are creepy. 
This explains why even the most advanced robots we have nowadays just look wrong. The human brain is just too good at picking up on these minute details that are extremely hard to replicate. So unless the robot is so good that you literally just can't distinguish it from a real flesh and blood human, they will look wrong. Which is exactly why I say Deep is a walking red flag, because right away, unlike robots exhibiting human-like actions, she exhibits almost artificial qualities. Everything from her unnaturally consistent smile to the way she speaks. There is a fundamental mismatch in how we would expect a normal human to act, which immediately creates this odd sense of eeriness to every single encounter. And that's the absolute best part of this kind of horror. Nothing about it is outwardly scary. Something about Judy is off, sure, but it completely relies on your own mind to fill in the blanks as to what else might be lurking beneath the surface. This sort of implied horror is widely used in the genre and you've no doubt come across it yourself in many, many other stories. It's just an extremely efficient way of just exploiting another fundamental fear all of us have, the fear of the unknown. Exhibit A, the fear of darkness. No one is afraid of the dark on a fundamental level, same as no one is afraid of heights. They are afraid of what happens if they fall off said heights. These are primal instincts that humans develop to survive. So the reason why you might fear the dark is not because it is inherently scary, but rather because there might be something that is lurking in the darkness. Fundamentally, you fear what you do not know, not the darkness itself. Exhibit B. Listen to these sentences and try to construct what might have happened in your mind. The woman was hysterical. She cried and yelled out. It was clear that she had just been through the worst experience in her life. I suspect many of you just constructed some really, really dark scenarios. But no. I was actually describing a woman who just got angry at a McDonald's over a wrong order. So again, simply exploiting the unknown. And so with Judy, as soon as we meet her, clearly something seems off, and your brain just naturally rushes in to fill the blanks, resulting in what is easily one of the creepiest characters in all of Avatar without ever doing a single creepy thing. And that is only compounded as we see the gang actually walk the city and interact with the locals. Something is just wrong. They are acting weird, they are dodging certain topics, something just feels off. Not scary, but just wrong. And that is of course not helped by the fact that we have very real Judys in the real world. If you were feeling spicy enough to visit North Korea, you would immediately be met by a state guide who would accompany you at all times. There too, if you look at photos, you will immediately get the same exact feeling as we're talking about right now. Broadly speaking, this picture looks normal, right? But then you notice that the computers aren't even on and the people in the picture are just acting as if they were clicking keys. You look at the roads and they are massive. This looks like a city, right? But there are so few cars. You notice the stores that are packed almost too perfectly. All of these things could technically have a reasonable explanation. But still, your brain picks up on just something feeling off. And that's what I think this Lake Lao Gai arc absolutely nails right from the get-go. From the moment we set foot in Ba Sing Se, even if you are completely unaware of all the psychological effects and real-world parallels and so on, you just know that we are not welcome here. Which naturally brings us to our characters trying to push through this fake mirage in pursuit of the truth. And again, we have the same theme on both sides here. As I mentioned before, Jet desperately tries proving that Iroh and Zuko are firebenders, which ultimately ends with him taking a brief trip to Lake Lao Gai. More on that in a second. Though on the gang's side, we too find ourselves asking the somewhat terrifying question of, are we the crazy ones here? The Avatar himself arrives claiming to have the most important piece of information in turning the tide in this now 100 year long war. But no one cares. Not only that, people don't even know there is a war. And yeah, at first you're like, okay, these are just a handful of wacky people. But one after another, they say the same thing. And suddenly, it is Team Avatar that just seem like the odd ones out. Let me quickly give you a admittedly quite wacky, but just a quick thought experiment. Can you reasonably prove that the life you are living right now did not start last Thursday? Everything in the known universe, from the stars in the night sky to every single one of your memories. Can you truly prove that it did not start last Thursday? Just think about that for a moment. This is a very real conceptual theory that exists. 
the paradoxical explanation that everything that exists just appeared on a random Thursday. But okay, that is completely ridiculous, let's be honest. Let me ask you a simpler question. Can you prove that any of your memories are true? Remember that time you forgot your keys? Or better yet, remember that time when you and your friends were retelling what was supposed to be the same story, but the details differed? Well, clearly, the memories aren't perfect, right? So, can you truly trust anything you know? I'm not trying to gaslight you here either. What I'm getting at here is that this eerie mirage of what we see in the show exploits another fundamental fear. Insecurity and not being able to trust yourself. If everything and everyone around you tries to prove you wrong, naturally, most people will begin to ask the very chilling question of, am I the odd one out? Many, many other stories have exploited this core insecurity we all feel to varying degrees of success. But to me, the denial of the truth, combined with the sense of isolation and beginning to question your own standing, is absolutely terrifying. And again, what to me is the most terrifying aspect is that none of this is explicitly or outwardly scary. It just once again, for lack of a better word, feels wrong. And I think here too, Avatar excelled in selling that uneasiness. Though I think that is best exemplified with the gang running into Jets. Because unlike with the war, where they could at least rely on each other, with Jets, things are very, very different. This doesn't make any sense. They're both telling the truth. In my mind, this single sentence perfectly encompasses everything I've been talking about for the past couple of minutes. Because suddenly, we have a paradox. They are talking about the same story, but are saying different things. Yet both are telling their absolute truths. And something about that just seems so unsettling to me. How can you ever know that you are in the right? If I can get like super real with you real quick, this is why I think dementia is so, so scary. It's one of my greatest fears, in fact. The loss of control and confidence always looming over every single moment of your life is just terrifying to me. And that's why I find this whole memory wiping and the whole sleeper agent angle of the Dai Li so, so unsettling. And as with most things in this arc so far, again, nothing about it is outwardly scary. There are no GigaChat Earthbenders using some, let's say, interrogation techniques to make you silence. Rather, it is so, so much more insidious and simply relies on you effectively driving yourself mad over trying to understand just what is even real. Though saying that, while much of this episode does very much leverage psychological horror, there is also a very explicit antagonistic force at play, right? That, of course, being Long Fang and the Dai Li, which on top of everything we've talked about so far, also introduced the so-called Big Brother angle. Or, in other words, a sort of a government or in some other way omnipotent force always trying to control a person's behavior and thoughts. First off, it obviously just comes with the usual uneasiness that just comes from always being watched. Humans are inherently social creatures. And knowing that you are in some way always being watched will fundamentally change how you act and think. Just think of that one person you know who has put some tape over their webcam. Even the sheer possibility of someone watching already makes us defensive. And in the case of Avatar, because this isn't full-blown 1984 with mass surveillance and all that, I think that angle is, to an extent, even more unsettling because fact of the matter is, you do not know when and if you are being watched, right? In these dystopian stories, where every single aspect of your life is constantly under a microscope, at some point you just simply conform. But what if that pressure is not continuous? What if you do have some of these moments in between when you feel like you are safe? Well, on the face of it, that should seem better, right? But personally, I think the constant questioning of, am I being watched right now, is far more taxing than simply knowing that there is no escape. And okay, like, watching you, yeah, that is very, very creepy. But as long as you play by the rules, you should be fine, right? Well, that is where the far more unsettling aspect of this concept comes into play. Because if everything around you is manufactured to convey a certain narrative, and everyone is constantly being watched to confirm to said certain narrative, are any of your thoughts truly your own? Can you really say you've made a well-thought-out decision if you are, by design, working with incomplete and potentially even deliberately altered information? For example, think of walking in the streets and seeing a long line to what looks to be a totally normal store. Clearly, you'd be curious about why is there a line, right? 
even very, very small scale examples of social trust like this already shows us how malleable our attention is. Especially if others around you believe the same thing. Wait, I just realized I am five pages into a script about a PG-7 animated show and I am basically describing how completely insane tinfoil hat conspiracies are born. Well... But that's exactly why I think this psychological horror works so so well and as much as I joke about it, I think there is also a reason why these sorts of fears and wacky conspiracies are prevalent in the real world. Especially nowadays when many of us have a whole lot more time to just sit around and think about completely random things. Sort of like I am doing right now I suppose. But alright, back to Avatar. At this point, you'd imagine that the episode would have already hit all the marks for psychological horror, right? We have a very strong feeling of isolation, the uncanny eeriness of Zhu Deep, who largely already draws on some real world inspirations, we have the horrifying nature of questioning your own sanity, and now we have this omnipotent force that is always watching. Surely, there cannot be any more. I mean, this is a children's show. Yeah, well, that then takes us to Lake Lao Guy, which, on top of everything we've discussed already, also reinforces the whole sleeper agent vibe of Zhu Di and adds liminal spaces as the final cherry on top. I think there's an entire different conversation to be had around the whole Lake Lao Guy testing facility and the real world inspirations for something like that, particularly in times of war as we see in Avatar. But there, I think it'd be interesting to rope in some other series like Stranger Things for example, that are almost entirely based off of real world experiments and use that at the heart of their story. Whereas Avatar only really uses it as a backdrop for everything else going on within Ba Sing Se. So it is definitely just another super creepy aspect of this arc, but it is also of course much more explicit than everything we've talked about so far. Though at the same time, it also of course leverages even more implied horror. Because it also brings up the question of what happens in the rest of the facility. It's a big place, right? Though my favorite part of this is the liminal spaces we see in Lake Laoga itself. With countless backroom lore videos now all over the internet, I suspect most of you will know what these liminal spaces are. But in its most basic form, a liminal space refers to some sort of transitional period. These can be physical, like the hallway between two offices, or they can be emotional and psychological. For example, think of graduating college. That period between you being a student and entering the quote-unquote adult life can be considered as liminal. It is a transition period between these two major stages of life. This has been used implicitly through your typical dark hallway in many, many horror films. But it has also been used very explicitly in films like Coraline, where the liminal space in between was a literal transition between two lives. But I digress. Point is that, as soon as we enter the underground network that is like Lao Guy, we only ever see these liminal spaces. Tunnels sprawling in all directions leading to who knows what. And just like much of what we've talked about, it brings up that same unsettling feeling of not quite belonging. As if being stuck in this never-ending period of in-between. Made worse by the fact that we are of course searching for our good boy Appa. The horror of these sorts of liminal spaces largely comes from the same uncanny valley principle. There is a disconnect between what you expect to see and what is actually there. In a hotel hallway, you would typically expect to see some people, maybe a cleaning trolley, or at least something to break the monotony of the hallway. But when there is nothing, it seems eerie. Nothing about it is scary, but it looks odd. And the same goes for Lake Lao Guy. The hallways we see are almost entirely empty. Except for the brainwashing room we see, it is just unnaturally quiet. We don't know what purpose the tunnels serve or where they even lead to. Which, instead of scaring you with some explicit foe, rather leaves you in this perpetual feeling of uneasiness as if something could be creeping around any corner. Super Eyepatch Wolf has made a wonderful video covering the psychological horror of these liminal spaces. So I would certainly recommend giving that a watch if you want to dive deeper into the unsettling nature of these in-between places. Though with Avatar, I think this worked as the perfect capstone to all of those themes we had covered thus far. Not only does it bring together all of those themes of isolation, hidden truths, and puppet masters we've seen in this arc, it also exemplifies the purpose of Ba Sing Se in the bigger story. To an extent, our entire time here is one big liminal space in and of itself. The only reason why we are even here was to mount an invasion during the solar eclipse and to find Appa. It is simply an in-between stage to us ultimately taking the fight to the Fire Nation. 
And very fittingly, in order to reach that, we find ourselves in this very explicit liminal space underneath Ba Sing Se itself. And while this certainly isn't horror, this theme too continues on Zuko's side, as he too begins questioning his identity and ultimately finds himself also going from one stage of his life, that being capturing the Avatar, to another and letting go of that trivial pursuit. So, to try to wrap this whole thing up in a neat package, what is it that makes Lake Lao Guy so, so spooky? Well, it is exactly that. Literally speaking, there is nothing that really makes it scary. And that is precisely why it is so unnerving. Through leveraging a number of more psychological fears, alongside the surface level of finding leads to Appa and meeting the Earth King, it weaves in this underlying story of a far more insidious threat that you simply cannot overpower or outrun as with other foes in Avatar. It sets itself apart from the likes of Azula or even Sparky Sparky Boo Man, exactly because it never attempts to face you head on. Rather, it changes the way you perceive the very events around you, making you question absolutely everything. How is it that two opposing retellings of the same events can be true? How is your truth different from my truth? Is this fundamental sense of something being off and the uneasiness that brings, that easily makes the City of Walls and Secrets and Lake Lao Guy Avatar's most unsettling episodes? As for the scariest episode, well, that's a story for another day. And that's the video. I guess at this point I have these weird biannual returns to Avatar, but I have a feeling that with the live action version being just around the corner, I might be talking about it a whole lot more, whether it's good or bad. Unfortunately, this version of Kuroto is stuck in the past, so I haven't seen the Netflix events and I haven't seen any of the previews. But I'm sure it's great, and if it's not, then ignore that, and I'm sure it's terrible. But whatever the case, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!